thank you so much for taking the time to join our panel discussion today. I'm Elaine Kwok, and I am the Director of Marketing at Peak Power. And if you're not familiar with us, uh, at Peak Power, we are making power plants obsolete. We're a team of energy nerds that develop software for the real estate sector. Our tech transforms commercial buildings and industrial facilities into virtual power plants and a new decentralized electricity system. This means cleaner, more reliable, and more affordable electricity. We are powering the clean energy revolution. So today we have a fantastic group of panelists that will be discussing the future of, of the Inflation Reduction Act. So if you have any questions during the discussion, you can drop them in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. And you can also upvote other people's questions. So if you have the same question, please upvote it. And this will tell us the order in which we're going to answer the questions at the end. Um, if you have any questions about anything else, please drop it in the chat. And we will address them <laughs> as well as we can. Um, and we actually do have a question for everybody online today. Uh, we just want to know, what do you hope to learn today from us? And from then on, I'm going to ask all of our panelists to please turn on their cameras. And uh, Matt Sachs, our COO, he will be uh, moderating this panel. Thank you again. On to you, Matt. Thanks so much, Elaine. And uh, thank you, everyone, for taking the time. What a good day to, to join us. It's going to be a really uh, interesting discussion of something that's going to have a huge impact uh, on our industry. My name is Matthew Sachs. I am the uh, Chief Operating Officer of Peak Power and one of the co-founders. And uh, we've got a really great panel. Um, instead of uh, me kind of bungling through you know, their history and introductions, I'm going to pass it through and let each of the panelists uh, introduce themselves. So uh, Helen, why don't you go first? Yeah, well, hello, everyone, Matt and the rest of the Peak Power team. Um, thank you so much for having me. So my name is Helen Ko, and I'm an energy associate, uh, energy storage associate at Bloomberg NEF. And for those who don't know Bloomberg NEF, Bloomberg NEF is a clean energy research division of Bloomberg. We generate insights and reports relating to the energy transition across power, transport, and industrial sectors. Uh, thanks, Helen. Pooja, how about you, you go next? Yeah, great to be here. Thanks, Matt. Um, uh, Pooja Shah here. I'm a senior consultant with uh, DNV. Um, I'm part of the Power and uh, Renewable Energy Grids Group. Um, I lead owners engineering work for energy storage and uh, work closely with developers and utilities to help um, development of uh, battery energy storage projects. Thanks, Pooja. And Elizabeth? Thanks, Matt. And hello, everyone. Hi, Elizabeth Knoll here with Holland and Knight. Um, I recently joined Holland and Knight and have been really focused on supporting many of our clients that are trying to uh, secure government funding that was part of the Infrastructure and Investment and Jobs Act, as well as the Inflation Reduction Act. So really trying to navigate all of these new federal resources and um, help the clean energy transition. And just prior to joining Holland and Knight um, earlier th uh, in the summer, I was with the Department of Energy in the Congressional and Intergovernmental Affairs Office. So I have a, a very uh, good understanding of the, all of the ins and outs of these pieces of legislation, um, as well as how kind of the department is thinking about implementing them. So really excited to be here today. Thanks, Matt. All right, thanks a lot, Elizabeth. So as you guys can see, uh, three really experienced uh, women that uh, have deep understanding of the uh, the policy and regulatory space as it uh, impacts the Inflation Reduction Act. So for today, I wanted to keep it really interesting. The idea isn't to get these experts to, to read through the act. You know, I think we've got better use of times. So we wanted to talk about uh, the implications, what this means for your business, strategies to take advantage of it, and even uncovering some of the, the risks and potential unintended consequences of how this act uh, might um, actually come to pass and, and, and impact us. So, uh, but to get into that, I think it is worthwhile for everyone to at least get on the same page of just the basics of what we're talking about. So I've prepared a, a very short deck that I'll go into just to cover the basic basics so we can have a useful starting point for discussion. So uh, assuming that you guys can see the screen, we'll uh, just set the stage of uh, how the Inflation Reduction Act will affect future energy storage projects. So first off, I said this is the basic basics. 
What do we need to know? It's a $369 billion program that's going to create new funding for energy security and climate change. Uh, the most um, uh, prominent measure of this act is the investment tax credit. Everyone talks about it as a 30% uh, tax credit, the 30% ITC. In fact, that's not the reality of it. It's a 6% that gets multiplied by five if prevailing wage and apprenticeship criteria are met. That has implications for contracting and who you're working with as your EPCs and developers. And there are additional bonus amounts. You can actually get higher than 30% if you uh, use domestic content in the assets, if you develop in energy communities and low income communities, you can get up to 50% total. And we're gonna go into that in a little bit more detail, first off the nuances, but again, also the strategy around maximizing that. And also very importantly, it's um, in some cases not a true tax credit because they've created mechanisms where it can be monetized through direct pay and transferability provisions. Uh, what this means is even if you don't have a, um, uh, a, a tax that you're um, crediting against, there are still ways to get the benefits of these provisions. Last thing I'll say here is that the uh, Inflation Reduction Act goes much further beyond just the ITC. There are billions of dollars in uh, grant and subsidies for specific sectors. Uh, I won't go through them all here, but um, uh, these programs are being announced. Uh, some of them are already open. Some of them are looking for stakeholder consultations and uh, many more are set to be announced over the next few years. So I'm gonna stop there and get right into the fun of it and into some of these questions. So if you give me just one moment. Uh, Elizabeth, I'm going to start with you. The Inflation Reduction Act, generally considered to be a groundbreaking clean tech legislation, uh, certainly from my perspective at peak power, this is the one initiative that really has uh, done the most to create tailwinds for the industry. But I have to say, it's been a long and winding journey to get here, and uh, really quite dramatic. Can you tell us a bit about the history of this legislation and some of the drama leading up to its eventual announcement? Sure, Matt. Yeah, this this one I lived when I was at the Department of Energy, so I'm happy to. Um, but I think really, you know, we saw um, as far back as you know the Biden um, administration during the the campaign this real commitment to climate action. Um, it, it started off as his American Jobs Plan, which really set out the vision that was to become the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, and a lot of that built on, you know, legislative proposals going back even before the 117th Congress, you know, the House of Representatives, they held hearings throughout the 116th Congress and put together this big package, the Clean Futures Act. Um, it was really an economy-wide climate package. Um, and then I think as, as you saw it evolve, you know, we saw it um, move into this, this has to be done through reconciliation which um, is just a tool that allows um, the, the Senate to move it forward because there was such a razor thin majority for the Democrats. So reconciliation is just um, kind of a, a tool, but it had to have a budget impact. And so then we saw a lot of those legislative proposals then translated once again into something that would be quote unquote, you know, birdbath approved or reconciliation proof. Um, and have a budget impact. Um, and so, you know, early versions of the IRA that, that I worked on, I mean, they had things like the Clean Electricity Payment Program, which was the version of a clean energy standard that could go through reconciliation. Um, so, I mean, I could, I could spend the entire hour talking about all of this, and I don't want to do that, but I think the bottom line here is you know, we saw what was once a $3 trillion package evolve into the $369 billion uh, package that passed that you noted uh, at the top, Matt. And, um, and this has just historic, even at that level, historic investments in climate, historic investments in clean energy, which are just going to be huge when we look forward, especially with the certainty that it provides over the next 10 years. Um, and coupling this with the Chips and Science Act and the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, that was the big infrastructure package from last year. You know, it's just a lot, a lot to be excited about for, for this industry. 
Uh, Elizabeth, you mentioned the importance of certainty, and certainly policy certainty is critical when you're developing these uh, projects with multi-year uh, financing for it. Um, the, the, the act was passed when the Democrats had, you know, control, um, uh, slim control, but control of the House and Senate. Um, we, we found out, uh, I guess this morning or just yesterday, um, that the, the um, uh, Senate is still going to be under uh, Democratic control, but the House has swayed to Republican. Do you think that the Republican control of the House may impact the execution of this legislation? I mean, we're going to be feeling this for years. Does this give them uh, or does this create any risk that certain aspects of it might be clawed back? Yeah, that's been a, a, a topic of conversation, but I feel pretty good. I mean, yes, Republican control in the House, there will be increased uh, attention to things like oversight, how are taxpayer dollars being spent, are they being spent well and effectively, um, and there will be efforts to, to try to claw it back. But I feel pretty good that there is a lot of support, especially in the tax credit space, that 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 will withstand Republican kind of uh, you know attempts to claw it back. Um, there will be other provisions, I'm sure, that may not withstand that. But the 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 tax credit piece in particular um, is so broadly supported, and these are going to be jobs that are being created in communities. So it, I think it's going to be much more difficult to do that than we've seen in the past. It seems that the conversation is changing a little bit because most likely the war in Ukraine and the realization of energy security being such a big issue. Absolutely. A lot of the provisions, even though they're they're um, talking about climate uh, primarily, the funding, a lot of it is framed around resiliency and security. So does that create a little bit more of a buffer or, or um, uh, a frame that both sides of the aisle that can get uh, uh, together in a bipartisan way? Are you seeing people um, uh, coming around to that and, and, and seeing it from that lens? Absolutely. I mean, I think resilience underscores all of this. I think that that's really important to note. Um, it's, it's also the movement toward like electrification, supply chain, and what we think we'll touch on later. But all of these things I do think are help are only going to help cement this policy. And one thing I would also note, you know, while it was passed in a partisan way with the Democrats only, many of these provisions, many of them were supported by Republicans. Um, so I, I think that there's also just kind of a there is support for this. Um, and so I think that's going to also just make it more challenging to try to to to, to mess around with the policies that are standing. OK, thanks so much, Elizabeth. Um, Helen, turning to you, you know, it's easy to understand that a tax credit that reduces the cost of energy storage should increase deployment, right? Uh, makes sense. It's, a, it's, a, it's an obvious lever. But can you give us a bit more insight into um, how the uh, IRA will impact storage deployments across the U.S.? And what I'm getting at is, you know, um, each region, each state and ISO has their own energy storage policies. Uh, and markets that are at different stages of development, um, will there be winners and losers or certain regions that will benefit most? And, and why do you think that is? Yeah, so you can totally tell that this was a pre-planned question because I'm gonna share my screen. <laughs> so if everyone can see my screen. Ellen is just prepared for anything here, really. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, uh, if you can see my screen, uh, so at Bloomberg NEF, we've looked into basically how the Inflation Reduction Act impacts energy storage deployments by accessing how the production tax credit for both wind and solar, as well as the investment tax credit, would then impact energy storage deployments across 12 major U.S. regions. Um, to get into the nitty gritty, what we do is we utilized our proprietary least cost system capacity build model to calculate deployments given new LCOEs for wind, solar, and storage due to the IRA. And the chart that I'm sharing on the screen right now shows annual storage uh, capacity additions pre-IRA, which was our previous scenario at Bloomberg NEF, and then with the IRA, which is our current scenario. And what you can clearly see from the chart 
is that deployments have increased 24% uh, in terms of gigawatt terms from 2022 to 2030. And that is just an immense addition of battery deployments uh, that we just expect because of the IRA. Now, like Matt mentioned, it really does vary a lot region to region. And this next chart here will show kind of how deployments change by region. Um, so California is already a really big market for batteries, and we expect the IRA to add additional 6.5 gigawatts of deployments from 2022 to 2030. Batteries are already the choice, uh, resource choice of California for capacity shortfalls, but we know that the, the addition of a standalone ITC just makes the economics of storage even more attractive in that region. And we also see a significant boost in residential storage deployments as batteries become a cheaper backup power option for many households. Uh, Texas, which is a purely merchant market, uh, is primed to gain the most from a standalone storage ITC, and it's going to add roughly 8.9 gigawatts of additional projects, and that's due to just higher deployments of renewables and lower energy storage costs. Now, New York and New England, which is the purple and the kind of light green, mint green uh, bar graphs, those two markets have historically primarily been um, a policy driven market. Um, and like what we've seen is that instead of just state targets really driving deployments with uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, we're going to see higher penetrations of distributed solar. And th because of that, we're going to see additional energy storage deployments, roughly around 4.7 gigawatts between the two markets. Now, kind of the two big markets that I skipped, which was PJM and Southwest in this bar chart, like what we've seen is that in those markets, we're expecting less energy storage deployments in those markets than what we can see purely off of economics alone. And kind of the reason why is because in PJM, there's a lot of interconnection constraints that are limiting the onset of solar deployments, which then limits the onset of energy arbitrage opportunities and therefore battery deployments. And then the Southwest, what we're seeing is that like fire safety concerns uh, is really inhibiting potential additional deployments in that region as well. And so I think what this kind of shows is that even though tax credits are incredibly useful and incredibly helpful, um, that there are other limiting factors that can can limit deployments across across the U.S. So, so Helen, let's dig into that a little bit deeper because you know when we go to develop sites as Peak Power uh, or some of our our partners, um, uh, we find that the the biggest issues are really the supply chain constraints and the long interconnection queues. So, mm -hmm. even if the project economics works out. Uh, and even if the ITC improves it and reduces CapEx, there could be other factors that are going to limit growth. So um, are you seeing that? Are there any risks that, we, uh, that, we, that um, the energy storage growth doesn't occur as we expect, uh, even with the tax credits in place? Ooh, good question. And I mean, there are so, there's so many risks. <laughs> out there. I mean, there's like issues on price cannibalization in ancillary services, you know, labor shortages, um, particularly on the EPC side. Uh, but but I think like for much of the industry, a uh, battery system cost is probably the most important risk of, of the day. Uh, BNEF just recently published our battery price survey on December 6th, yesterday. And um, as we noted in our publication, battery cell prices have gone up for the first time since we've tracked battery cell prices. Um, and they're up 7% from the previous year. And that, that has a lot of implications on energy storage deployments in the near term. What we know is that, you know, supply chain constraints, especially on like just the limited amount of raw materials, particularly on lithium, is going to have an increase, uh, an implication on price increases on battery cells in the near term. And we know that the market will remain tight for the near term and that that just could potentially have uh, have an impact on higher system costs and therefore potential limitations on how and where things will deploy. And if I understand that 7% increase, 
was due to factors that came into place before the IRA, um, it's possible that vendors mark up their, their systems more with the feeling that the industry can weather it because there's a 30% decrease. Is yeah, I would say that's a, that's a fair statement. So what we know is that the you know, investment tax credit and, and IRA in general is going to boost, deploy, boost demand. And when there's an increase in demand and there's just more appetite, um, there's potential for suppliers to then also increase their prices given limited supply. Okay, uh, um, Helen, one last question for, I'm gonna change uh, the direction a little bit, but can you provide a bit more context on this uh, energy community and low income community provisions? How can developers take advantage of those opportunities? Right, so there are a lot of additional like bonus tax credits in the new clean electricity investment tax credit. Um, we know that, like you mentioned that there's a 10% bonus domestic content credit um, but the specific ones relating to the energy community and low income tax credit, um, there's like specifically a 10% um, energy community tax credit. In, in this case, the projects must be located in a brownfield site or a census tract in which a coal mine or a coal plant retired after 1999, at least based on the bill text. Um, and there's also an additional low income uh, tax credit for basically um, projects that are located within a Native American land, which gives a 10% credit, or a low-income residential residential building, which gives a plus 20% credit. And these credits for energy community and low income, they're coming into force on January 1st, 2025, or uh, at least apply to properties placed in service before December 31st, 2024. Uh, based on bill text. And so really right now for the industry, it's about, you know, reading through and making sure that um, projects can qualify for those specific types of bonus tax credits and gearing up a really strong pipeline uh, before these tax credits come into place. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, Pooja, moving over to you, um, uh, energy storage developments and, and renewables in general, you know, can have some really nuanced and detailed legal and contractual structures. Uh, for example, power purchase agreements, third party ownership of assets, uh, land leases, all those are pretty common in the energy industry. Uh, do you have any advice on how to best structure energy service agreements uh, to get the maximum benefits from the IRA? Sure, that, that's a great question. And contracting and legal is definitely, you know, really nuanced and can get very detailed. So I'm going to try and provide some some background history and then, you know, try and, um, you know, explain a little bit and make, make it as simple as possible for uh, folks to understand here. And, uh, you know, Helen gave a great intro. I can build off of a lot of things that she mentioned that will potentially impact how creative developers and utilities can get with uh, project financing and project development. Um, so going back to the history a little bit, battery energy storage was previously eligible for clean energy tax credits, but the only way it was eligible for tax credits was that if it was directly connected to solar and it had to be powered by solar for at least 75 uh, 70 percent of the year so what that essentially did was it led to a disproportionate investment in solar plus storage hybrid projects now with the ira um, and the standalone invest investment tax credit what it does is it provides more support for standalone store, uh, storage projects by reducing the cost and uh, storage projects can now be developed um, without so they can be independent of renewable energy or, uh, you know, particularly solar. So the IRA has standalone uh, tax credit for battery capacities of about three kilowatt hours in the residential and over five kilowatt hours in the uh, commercial market. And, uh, you know, in both of these markets, we will see uh, capital costs going down, which will improve uh, or increase uh, residential and commercial uh, energy storage um, projects. The ability to apply separate tax credits between solar and storage uh, will also simplify financing and engineering a little bit. Uh, it'll provide clear 
a more clear uh, path to metering and uh, potential for redundancy and de-risking some of the measures. Uh, it'll also allow some of the solar developers to choose between investment tax credit uh, that are based on some of the installation costs and then the production tax credits that are based on uh, power generation costs. Standalone storage also provides a variety of creative solutions for developing and financing, as I was mentioning before. And uh, you know, one of the ways that most developers do this is through uh, a revenue contract, which is basically what we call the offtake agreement or the PPA. And, and that's where, you know, going back to your question, how, how does some of these things in the uh, IRA uh, standalone ITC impact contractual offtake structures? Um, energy storage has a lot of different technical capabilities. It can provide, you know, a range of services outside of just being paired with renewable energy. And so it can help with other ancillary services as well. And uh, the way offtake agreements are structured, um, they can they they are usually based on what the project or the product, the energy storage product, is actually selling. Whether it's energy, or whether it's capacity, or whether it's ancillary services, or it can be a combination of any of these. And so, when before the IRA and the standalone IT uh, storage ITC, uh, most of the uh, contracts, the uh, offtake agreements, the way they were structured were they were, um, you know, energy only um, uh, payments in which the project is compensated for the energy that it is providing. So, uh, you know, it can be from the solar or from the storage. So, uh, but that, because of that 70% um, that it had to be, uh, the, the storage had to be powered 70% of the time from solar. Um, most of it was being routed through storage and then it was considered a single entity and going back to, uh, you know, uh, that was the energy that was being um, uh, structured in the offtake agreement. But now with that, with that being decoupled and standalone storage having its own credit, uh, you know, we can um, actually structure those contracts differently. We don't actually need to be only um, uh, structure it based on the energy or, or the capacity that it's selling. It can also include ancillary services like uh, um, helping resolve uh, some of the resiliency challenges or you know transmission congestion or demand response or demand management, those sort of things. So if I, if I say that from a developer's perspective, instead of simply signing a power purchase agreement selling kilowatt hours, we can now decouple and use the energy storage system to operate in front of the meter applications, provide different revenue streams, as well as perhaps kilowatt hours uh, in addition to the ancillary services. Yes, exactly. And uh, some of the other creative ways could also be having standalone storage in uh, different locations all across the US or, or in different states or in different regions without being coupled with solar. And these can be used in a virtual power plant sort of uh, an application and the offtake agreement could be structured where uh, you could uh, call on those uh, standalone energy storage projects to uh, provide that uh, uh, power okay, when needed. Super interesting. And um, could you uh, talk to us briefly about the uh, prevailing wage and the apprenticeship clauses that were mentioned in the introduction? Um, uh, is, from a contractual perspective, if you're a developer, uh, how, how do you make sure that you qualify for those? Yeah. So the, the Inflation Reduction Act specifically has a requirement that all projects larger than uh, one megawatt uh, AC must pay its workers a prevailing wage and institute an apprenticeship, apprenticeship program. And uh, so if the project wants to claim the full 30% uh, investment tax credit, um, what they would have to do is they would have to pay prevailing wages and then the ITC will provide a 6% credit in, or if they don't uh, uh, pay that wage, then the ITC would only provide a 6% credit in place of the 30%. 
so, so hopefully the prevailing wage is a status quo. This is just to make sure that people don't try and, and you know, do anything sinister. Uh, th yeah. This shouldn't be a, a big hurdle to overcome. Yes. And though, uh, that, that goes into effect uh, January 23rd, and the U.S. Department of Treasury is just starting to release some guidance around it. So we'll see more about it uh, in the coming days. Okay, great. Okay, my next question is a general one. So, you know, we could do this Jeopardy style where everyone, you know, buzzes in if they've got the answer. But um, uh, for each of you, if we look back again on the, on the history of, of what we got there, the passing of the FERC 2222, um, that was huge for the industry. It kind of set the stage for the regulatory reform. And for those that aren't aware, FERC 2222 is a mandate from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission that every ISO and, and system operator, every utility has to change their market rules to allow uh, distributed energy resources like buildings, batteries, and vehicles to participate in wholesale energy markets. That happened in late 2020. So, that gave us the regulatory backdrop. Now the IRA is, is giving fuel to kind of reduce the, the capital costs. What else does the federal government need to do, if anything, to set the stage for this clean energy transition? Is it fair to say that in the US, the, the government has done their part, they're, got, they're good, and now it's up to developers and consumers to take it from here? Or are there some missing pieces that really from a regulatory and lobbying perspective, we need to continue to push the government because the job's not done yet. What would you say to that? I mean, I, I can go first. I mean, the short answer is no. <laughs> um, there's so much more that can be done. Um, and and like fundamentally, like I think like if I got to choose like what type of other additional policies that the government can focus on, I think interconnection um, remains just like an immense bottleneck for renewable energy deployments. Uh, we might have the right tax credit incentives, the right regulatory frameworks, but kind of none of that makes sense unless you can actually get projects connected onto the grid. And just the amount of wind, solar, and storage assets in interconnection queues from PJM to KISO, they just far, far, far outpace kind of what we expect at BNEF. Um, the projects co will come online this decade. Um, my colleague Javier has done some just incredible work assessing interconnection processes at Bloomberg NEF. And, you know, he's found that like MISO has the most efficient process right now with projects taking around 12 to 18 months after applications, while a market like PJM can take one to seven years. Um, and that's just too much time. Um, and a lot of reforms can be needed. So I, I want to do a small deep dive here, and then we'll go back to the main question. But this interconnection is such a huge issue. From my developer perspective, it seems to me that the process is, is um, not just that there's so many um, people signing up, but it's fundamentally flawed in the sense that they're looking at energy storage as if it's a generator, which um, is, you know, uh, an energy storage could act as a generator or as a load. Uh, and it, it seems to me they're limiting even the applicability of energy storage in areas where it's needed the most. Um, mm -hmm. What's your, your, your take on that? Is that, uh, would you agree that that's kind of the, the root of the issue or is it just bandwidth? Too many people trying to get in at, at, at the same time. I think it's probably a mixture of both. I mean, some of it is bandwidth. There's a lot of projects trying to flow through, but I mean, um, you're right in that for energy storage, like it's, it's quite a tricky technology. It's both generation and load. And for a little while, it's it historically has been very difficult for energy storage to participate in wholesale markets. Um, but FERC order 841, um, which basically allows, or. Uh, force system operators to look at regulatory frameworks for energy storage to better register and then participate in wholesale markets. That has provided some clarity in, in kind of just the way batteries can register, but there's still like a lot of nitty gritty regulatory frameworks that could be improved upon in terms of just how to best optimize battery dispatch across all various wholesale markets across the U.S. Um, Elizabeth and Pooja, going back to you, we've heard from Helen, she thinks there's more the government can do. What's, what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, I think the federal level, from a federal legislative level, I think um, there's still this outstanding permitting conversation that's ongoing. Um, it was not something that they could, that the government could do or that Congress could do through reconciliation. 
So it had to be pulled out and uh, Senator Manchin is continuing to fight to try to get it on any any must pass bills through the end of this Congress. Um, but it does look like that will be up for a prime conversation if it doesn't get done this year. Um, I, I, I do think that there's it, it is a little bit of both, too, though. I think there's a ton the developers and consumers also need to be doing and stepping up, especially, you know, in the implementation of these bills. Right. And so get making sure that we're being we're successful. The projects are getting done. We're telling the stories. We're engaging. We're helping to, you know, provide comments to IRS on the guidance on how to implement these laws. What is the spirit and intent so that it can be successful? I mean, the agencies, uh, the developers, you guys are the experts and agencies need to hear from you on where they're getting it right and where they might be getting it wrong. So um, I think it's it's a both and. So, so that role for pilots and leadership and all of this. Absolutely. Pooja, anything you'd like to add before I go to the next question? I would definitely agree with what uh, Helen and Elizabeth said. Um, and, uh, you know, the IRA definitely, uh, you know, does a little bit for, um, or maybe uh, quite a bit for, um, you know, the domestic manufacturing and helping with supply chain constraints, but there's always more that can be done given, uh, you know, how much uh, clean energy we need over the next uh, few years uh, to be able to address climate change. And then also just the amount of development we are seeing in that space. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so there's not enough domestic manufacturing right now, and we might see some supply chain constraints in the next coming years. And so there's definitely space there for, uh, you know, government to step in and help with some of those policies. Well, you mentioned domestic manufacturing. That's a pretty hot button topic. So let's dig in on that one a little bit. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act includes a, a Made in America clause. Um, which, you know, some people in other countries, I'm calling in from Toronto, Canada, uh, they may see that as a very protectionist clause. Uh, and interestingly, um, as a direct result of the US Inflation Reduction Act, a few weeks ago, Canada announced that we're getting our very own ITC tax credit. And they explicitly stated that it was a reaction. It was required to stay competitive with the US. So, would you see other countries, I'm thinking of, of China specifically here, but other countries taking action to compete against the US on clean tech deployment? And is this a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, in case of Canada and the ITC, it's a good thing because it lower costs in more countries. But if we have the US setting a made in America clause, I could easily see China doing the same thing, which would limit um, exports and create a net negative. So what's your take on how other countries are going to react to the IRA and whether that's going to be seen as a, a positive for developers that want to expand internationally or, or perhaps a negative? I mean, that's, that's a very big question. I think um, kind of to backtrack a little bit, I mean, like what we know is that like today, like China just dominates the world's like solar and battery supply chains. And, and based on analysis we've done at Bloomberg NEF, China owns more than 70% of the battery cell, cathode, anode, electrolyte, separator, manufacturing capacity in the world. And, and so for the US in Canada and, and also Europe, they're gonna need to play a lot of catch up with China. And we know that the cost of building cell manufacturing plants and metal refining plants can be incredibly expensive and is a long term investment, which is why we've seen, you know, domestic and protectionist contents in, in a lot of clean energy policies being passed recently. And even with those type of, you know, protectionist contents, it's really unclear today whether or not those incentives provided. Um, are going to be necessarily enough to outcompete China in terms of battery cell and battery system costs. But to kind of answer your question and whether or not these policies are, you know, a net positive, it, it really depends on your perspective. Like the current status quo, uh, where is, you know, China dominates 70% of the battery supply chain. And where there's great concentration in both cell and component manufacturing, there's just great vulnerability in supply. So from a pure resiliency perspective, it's just understandable why the US and China 
uh, or in Canada have put in, you know, protectionist clauses. Yeah. Um, and Going back to energy security, as you're saying yeah. before. Completely, it's it's very much an energy security thing, and I don't know. I do, I think like you can't count Europe out quite yet. Like we know in 2022, like clean energy manufacturing has really cropped back up in European Union priorities. Um, we know that a lot of those policies do seem to be a patchwork of grants and loans and programs from various member states. So like it's not necessarily going to be as it currently appears to be less impressive compared to the US, but it's definitely something we're keeping a very sharp eye out uh, here at BNEF. Yeah, the only thing I would add, it, totally agree, big question, and I think you could, it depends on your perspective, but you just one net positive I think that we're seeing in some of this is that um, things that didn't pencil before are penciling now, and that this is really spurring a lot of investment here domestically. Um, which is a good thing. I think we, we as we seek to transition and build out the workforce, we're going to need to have, and this is a really big uh, bet that the government is making on, you know, American leadership, and they're taking a lot of risks. So um, I think that I think that is a net positive for the long term to have our, our piece of this uh, clean energy technology development prize. So yeah. Pooja, anything you'd like to add to that? No, I think they <laughs> summed it up pretty well. Okay. So we're going to start to move to some of the um, uh, Q&A from the audience. Uh, I've been keeping a little eye uh, on the side here. So um, I'm just going to kind of jump through and ask some of these questions. There was one that I think we answered already um, regarding uh, demand and supply. Uh, Helen, I think I'll pose this one to you one. Uh, will demand really outstrip supply? Is there not enough supply coming online to address the increase in demand? I know this is something that the NEF looked at. Um, so could you talk a little bit about the timing of supply and, and how that matches with uh, the expectations in demand? Ooh, great question. It's something we're thinking about all the time at BNEF is like, where is supply? Where is the manufacturing capacity? And like, where is demand? And what we do know is that like, in terms of supply, um, and at least on the battery storage side, the key kind of supply chain constraint right now in our industry is raw materials and in particular lithium. And so we're tracking like lithium mining capacity, lithium refining capacity quite heavily. And that's kind of like what's causing, you know, price increases on lithium carbonate, which causes price increases on energy storage systems. Um, what we know is that prices will likely remain quite elevated in the raw material space in the near term because of just how big demand is in the near term in terms of both electric vehicles as well as stationary storage demand. But what we do see is that like regardless of higher system costs, demand continues to grow. And that really just comes down to policy. There's really strong policy and really big clean energy targets that just need to be met. And that continues to spur deployments even as costs continue to increase. That might change if costs continue to increase a lot. But for now, what we see is there's still a strong demand pipeline. Okay. Um, I'm going to jump to the questions that have the most upvote. So if you uh, if you all in the audience want to take a look and upvote your favorite questions or add some new ones, uh, there's a question here. Could you touch on if there's a different process for tax exemption entity to claim the direct pay for uh, BESS? So Pooja, maybe this one might be uh, appropriately directed to you. Um, is it is it a different process if you're going to go through the direct pay provision? Uh. I, yeah, for, I, for a tax exempt entity, I think that's I think mm -hmm. that's the key. If you're a, a nonprofit or some other type of tax exempt entity, how would yeah. you direct pay? I, I think we are still trying to understand the nuances of all of this and um, uh, getting more guidance on um, how different processes would work. Uh, but uh, I would think that yeah, there would be a different process um, uh, for tax exempt uh, entities. I mean, you touch on a great point. A lot of this is happening in real time. Yeah. The IRA, the IRS, I'm sorry, uh, is is still developing a lot of these terms. Even the Made in America provision, we only know notionally that it's coming. We don't actually know how it's going to be defined yet. Yeah, absolutely. A, a lot of these guidelines are being uh, put out uh, as we talk about this right now. And uh, we are going to know more about it in the coming months. 
uh, on the guidelines themselves. And then also as these actually get put into place different contracts and uh, as these processes start happening, we, we are going to find out some, some challenges and some, uh, you know, loopholes and all of that that uh, comes into play and how that works out over the next couple of months. Yeah. So I would just add though, Matt, on the direct pay, that was a provision that was included in the Recovery Act in 2010. So we do have some experience that I I assume uh, the IRS will lean heavily on in terms of how uh, people will be able to qualify um, for those provisions. And uh, do you recall what a tax exempt uh, organization was required to do? I, I think it was just more like that, that you are a tax exempt entity in, in terms of how you are, you know, taxes or what you, what are you a 501c3 or a 401, you know, those kind of things. So um, it, it's more in your, in your, uh, how you would go about, about applying or um, complying with your tax. Gotcha. Okay, so a lot still for us to learn as the IRS plays it out, but some information we can pull from, from, from uh, previous programs. Um, there's a related question here about, we've talked about Made in America, the domestic content adder. Um, do, are we aware yet, does the panel and the battery have to be fully manufactured in the US, including raw materials uh, and all components for it to qualify? And then adding to this question, uh, would a Chinese owned manufacturing company based in the US be able to count as domestic content. So would any of you guys have some insights into that one? Uh, Helen, I see you nodding your head, so I'm gonna jump up to you. So, I mean, following with Pooja, like a lot of this information is still being developed. We're still waiting on clarifications um, from the IRS and the Treasury Department for just additional information, because you're right, like a lot of this is unclear right now based on the bill text, and there's just more information that needs to be kind of like flushed out. But on the um, the domestic, uh, the uh, Chinese-owned manufacturing that is manufacturing in the U.S., does that count as domestic content? I, I think we saw, at least in the battery manufacturing grants that DOE has already issued, which is separate from the tax credit, that there are, there is, that, that does qualify as long as you are manufacturing in the U.S. Um, and I think that's, that is at least the spirit of the law. Um, now, whether how IRS interprets it or or how the U.S. decide the, the government really t tries to implement it, um, it remains to be seen. And they are having oh, there's just a ton of conversation on like where you draw the line on component to to know what is and what is not. What is it? You know? So there's there's a lot of um, and I think it's, it's an opportunity for folks on this call that are interested in where they draw the line to really engage in providing comments to IRS and to really help flush that out so they understand it. Because remember, they're tax lawyers, not, not developers. So helping them is yeah. important. And uh, Elizabeth, you mentioned something. I just want to circle back to that. There has been other funding for domestic battery manufacturers and, and in fact, huge programs to support that separate from the IRA. So uh, it, it, it is a, a great opportunity for uh, people in that business in, in America right now. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Here's another question from the Q&A. Um, for behind the meter systems, does the, uh, the energy storage system, is it allowed to charge from the grid coupled with solar? Uh, so Pooja, I think you commented on this one a little bit. Um, uh, so may, perhaps you've answered parts of it. Anything that you want to add to that? So, um, yeah, it, it can be coupled with the solar. Uh, what uh, the IRA uh, tax credit provides for uh, specifically residential is it covers the tax credit up till uh, 2034 and up to 30% of the cost of the energy storage for homemaker uh, or uh, owners who are actually looking to capture that energy from their residential PV units that uh, they've installed over the years. So. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, again, it, it used to be that it had to be coupled with solar, and now it can be, but doesn't need to be. Right. Okay, great. Um, let's see, there's another question here. Can we talk about the role of the Inflation Reduction Act on energy storage uh, for distributed behind the meter systems? So I think this is referring to uh, any distinctions in the funding for front of the meter utility scale projects versus behind the meter uh, distributed projects. 
Uh, are they treated equally under the program? Or are there some benefits to one versus the other uh, from the perspective of the IRA? Elizabeth, any insight on your side? I'm not sure. Okay. So certainly from my reading of it, it, it seemed to treat them equally. Um, they, they both fall under the definition. Uh, they, they both would get the same uh, treatment. Perhaps there might be some narrative around the locational elements. Sometimes the front of the meter systems, mainly because they're bigger, are not in urban areas. Uh, so there might be some, uh, if you mapped it out, discrepancy between the low income and the energy communities. Actually, there could be a tie there, and this is off the top of, uh, of my thought here. The energy community definition is areas that historically have had energy generation, which likely means that there is distribution infrastructure, which likely means that they could be good locations for front of the meter systems. So there might be downstream uh, ties, but there's nothing explicit that I've seen that benefits BTM versus FTM. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, here's another question. Um, how much of the funds are allocated for new technologies uh, related to areas of clean energies like batteries and, and, and PV? I assume this is compared to you know, existing mature technologies that are more about deployment. So, so let's, let's frame this around innovation versus deployment. Is the Inflation Reduction Act an innovation act fundamentally, or is it a deployment act? I would say unequivocally it is a deployment act. Um, it is very much in, this, in the space of uh, getting clean technology over through the, through the valley of death, as they say, and into fully commercialized um, you know, in, in really accelerating that transition. Um, I think specific to, I think maybe the question too, like they, the Inflation Reduction Act from a tax credit perspective, it did extend existing tax credits like the production tax credit for a whole host of technologies, wind, solar, geothermal, um, it also the investment tax credit. And then it did expand it into new technology areas like storage that we're discussing here. Also production tax credit for hydrogen, for um, sustainable aviation fuels, for there's vehicle charging, which has been existing and then expanding that there. Um, so there's a, there is a lot of mixed bag. And then they also added this um, new like tech neutral tax credit that is to be implemented down the road, which will be really focused on, um, you know, what, what does your technology do to contribute to decreasing gr greenhouse gas emissions? So, you know, this is where like maybe there's a new technology that we haven't thought of. And rather than having a technology specific tax credit, it's a what is your contribution to reducing emissions? And then you get a tax credit as a percentage. So, um, but I think, you know, that it's hard to say like percentage wise, what goes to what. But I do think they were trying to be, make sure that they didn't leave anything behind this time and sure. really allowed for that in the future. So, so let's dig a, a little deeper there. Um, I mean, from maybe I'm too much, you know, lost in the sauce, but from my perspective, energy storage and photovoltaic is not really that innovative anymore. Uh, these are proven technologies that are riding down cost curves. When I think of innovation in the clean energy space, I think about vehicle to grid. Um, uh, you know, uh, like uh, multi-asset uh, applications of these technologies using uh, the energy storage systems for, for different applications. So um, Elizabeth, do you think that there's any risk that actually true innovation might be hampered because this money is going towards deployment or is the definition, as you said, uh, of just, you know, uh, emerging clean technologies sufficient to cover this this broad basket of potentially things we might not even think of today over the next 10 years in terms of innovation uh, in, in the space? Yeah, I, I really appreciate you asking that question because I definitely think it's important. I mean, this is a deployment policy for sure, but it is really important and it would be a true shame if we lose sight of our you know, bread and butter research expertise at the United States, our national labs and our universities and all of the things that we do to cultivate uh, an innovation ecosystem. So I think we need to continue to prime that pump that is largely funded through annual appropriations. And so making sure that the Department of Energy continues to have the resources it needs to do that kind of 
early stage research, first of a kind research, that kind of stuff. And if we're really just, you know, investing in the the technology today, we will be we will forever be playing catch up to China or other countries. So I definitely think we need to have opportunities to leapfrog and continue to invest in that next generation. That may not be tax credit type, uh, you know, that might be in the grants or the the loan space uh, or earlier or different kind of inve- uh, federal um, investments or federal support. Um, but I think we need to, we, we absolutely need to do both and, and we cannot lose sight of that next generation kind of research that, that we are, we are leaders in. So, so we've definitively answered the question from earlier. Yes, there is more that the government can do. This is great. Absolutely. <laughs> there, there is still more. Uh, okay. There was a, a follow-up question on a cost, um, uh, Helen, you mentioned that uh, BNEF has, uh, through the surveys, found a 7% increase. I'll say I was surprised, and, and um, the, uh, the person who put in the question, Kyle, uh, also expressed a bit of surprise about that. We're seeing lithium carbonate go up, you know, um, uh, Kyle put in 10x. I, I'm not sure if that's the exact number. It seems probably about right. Many of the components have gone up 10x. It's almost surprising that the uh, average price has only gone up 7%. Can you talk a little bit about that discrepancy? Yeah, absolutely. So kind of to get a little bit more specific, uh, battery cell prices increased 7% between 2022 and 2021. And this is including both on the stationary storage side and on the transport and auto industry side. And so, I mean, if when we're looking at it purely from a stationary storage side, what we know is that beyond just the battery cell, like other components of an energy storage system likely has also increased quite significantly. And so we do expect like probably a, a larger price increase uh, differential between 2021 and 2022 from a turnkey energy storage system cost. Um, and we also know that in general, like the stationary storage market is just much more exposed to raw material price fluctuations than the auto industry is just because on a shared volumes level, it's not as easily able to compete with the large EV and, and auto industry in terms of master supply agreements with battery cell manufacturers. So that increase in battery cell pricing is, is really coded with a kind of specifics on like the complexities within the battery uh, kind of supply chains on how stationary storage has to compete with the auto industry, as well as the additional cost components that um, we have on the stationary storage side that could change price increases. Something to flag is that um, BNEF will be publishing our energy storage cost survey by the end of December, which will be specific to the stationary storage industry and show co- like how costs have changed from 2021 and 2022, as well as provide a cost outlook um, for specifically the energy storage industry. And that gets into a lot more of the nuances on components and, you know, EPC margins and, and other specific things to stationary storage. Thanks for that, Helen. Uh, we're going to uh, start to wrap up. There's, there is one last question. Thankfully, uh, it's a, an easy one. Um, is, is there a cap on uh, how much any company or entity can apply for under the IRA funding? Uh, I mean, this is a tax credit, so uh, I would imagine there, there is no cap. As long as you are investing, you can get those credits. So that's an easy one. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Helen, Elizabeth, Pooja. Really appreciate. Uh, Elaine, I'm not sure if you had any um, uh, final comments. I wanted to thank all of our panels as well. This was a really great discussion. And I just want to ask our attendees to please look out for the post webinar survey. We are going to do more webinars. So any anything that you can tell us about what you want to see that that will really help us build our programming. But and thank you so much for joining. Thank you everyone so much. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Hi. Thank you.